show. My name is Yong King Ngai. I'm your host today. And together with me is... I'm Chuan Singh. Now recently, the Singaporean prison had executed a Malaysian man, Nagan Tran K. Damalingam, who had an intellectual disability and was coerced to drink and ca to carry in drugs. This high-profile case has sparked controversy in among citizens in both Malaysia and Singapore. And a debate on whether death penalty truly upholds justice has been raised again. For the record, Singapore has one of the strictest drug laws in the world. Other than Singapore, countries like the United States, China, Iran, Egypt, Thailand and Malaysia retain the death penalty punishment until today. According to the Amnesty International, as for February 2022, Malaysia had 1,341 people on its death row, with 905 of them having been condemned under the mandatory death sentences for drug trafficking. So our issue here today is whether justice can be truly upheld by imposing mandatory death sentences. What is the meaning of the word justice? Aquinas defines justice as a habit whereby a man renders to each his due by a constant and perpetual will. Some concepts of justice include retributive justice, which means an eye for an eye concept, utilitarianism, which means maximizing welfare of the society, deterrence, usually in the form of imprisonment, and corrective justice, which means returning to the status quo. At the end of the day, different scholars might have different definitions on the word justice. But our focus today is on justice in punishments. When we discuss about mandatory death sentence, it refers to the punishment of death penalty as provided for certain offences, and the death penalty must be executed upon conviction by the court and when the accused has no more chances of appeal. The Malaysian cabinet has decided recently to abolish the mandatory death penalty since 2022, and necessary amendments are underway in Parliament at the time of speaking. Though this move has been widely applauded and welcomed by the United Nations and several other human rights bodies, the real questions here are number 1. Can the mandatory death penalty truly uphold justice? And number 2. If the mandatory death sentence is to be abolished, does it mean that there is no more justice in the Malaysian society? Aristotle said that justice is giving one what is due to him, giving one what is his own. However, the question of what is due to somebody and how exactly we can restore the status quo remains a question as to what and how can we decide what it means in achieving justice. Generally, capital punishment is justified by retributive justice or eye for an eye concept. However, as seen in the statistic, most of the criminals convicted with death sentences involve drugs, which is not exactly a harm to the body of others. Hence, we would like to discuss a different theory as a way to address wrongdoings, which is restorative justice. Rather than punishing the wrongdoers and letting them suffer in proportion, restorative justice focusing, focuses on making amends. Restorative justice is a process whereby parties with a stake in a specific offence collectively resolve how to deal with the aftermath of the offence and its implications for the future. To discuss this matter, there are three main principles of restorative justice. Firstly, let's hear from Miss N, a family member of one of the convicted criminals. Hi Miss, can you introduce yourself and tell us why you are here with us today? Uh, hello everyone, my name is Nanda Sophia and I've been married with Beza for seven years now. The first two years, we were very happy um, and it was amazing. Chao was very kind, supportive and his business is also doing well. The business that we had together, uh, he started first and when we got married, I helped with him and it became our main source of income. I do have another job also that I'm doing sometimes but Chow's only job uh, is the sampai business. I think it was around the fourth year uh, of the operations. The sales suddenly became lesser and lesser until eventually I had to take 
the orders for growth more than operating the business itself, the sambal business. My husband, on the other hand, he started to hang out uh, more than uh, than trying to improve our sales and household income. I didn't realize it at first. I thought he went outside just to meet meet his friends because he was too stressed out of the business and stuff. So I let him be. We were both quite stressed with, I would say, but day by day, he comes back later and later. Sometimes at 1 a.m., sometimes at 3 a.m., something like that. So when I questioned him, he didn't answer. Our sambal business, just stop it, just like that. When one day, he came home at 6 a.m. in the morning, I inspected, inspected his back, and that's when I found it on the trucks. My husband has been using it for three years, and for three years, I don't have a husband. The past three years, I feel completely alone, surviving on my own. I couldn't even bear the pain. Because I need to support myself and my family. I even need to borrow from my friends, my neighbors, in order to survive for my family. My husband's addiction had affected my life so much physically, emotionally, and also financially. So, my last wish, uh, I just hope that he's getting better. Okay. Uh, thank you, Miss Nadia, for being with us today. We hope everything will be better, everything will turn better for you and your husband. In restorative justice, the stakeholders are presumably the victim, the offender, and the community. Although primary victims are the most directly affected by the offence, restorative justice views other people, such as family members of both victims and the offender, witnesses, and members of the affected community as victims as well. This is done so to find restoration, healing, responsibility and prevention. According to Finnis's principle of justice, the general principle is that one should promote the common good in one's community and a certain amount of cooperation and behaviour coordination are necessary for the common good. The basic question is always that of how the common good can best be served. When it is appropriate to think of people as engaged in common enterprise, it may be appropriate to adopt the perspective of distributive justice. Moving on to the second principle, we will take a look at the principle from the offender's point of view. So today, we are interviewing two drug addicts that have been convicted and they are willing to share their story with us. Good day, Mr. Chow. Can you tell us more about yourself and maybe your story? I to share. Well, my name is Chow. Uh, I've been a drug addict for three years and I've been convicted. Yeah. So I got a wife. Her name is Nadia. We've been married for seven years already. I start doing drugs after my friends introduced to it to me during our frequent hangout. Due to the stress of my our unsuccessful samba business, I need something to get with. So my friends told me about ice, the blue ice. It's a famous name for meth. Well, after being convicted, I realized that it's not only I cause harm to uh, myself but also to my lovely wife Nadia. At first, it was fun doing math because you got to experience being in for euphoria. But you know, the effect of it is, especially the addictions, is as far most worse than fun. My health started to deteriorate and I was exposed to various kind of disease. 
Not only that, I have been neglected my responsibility towards Nadia after. She had to bear all the problem by herself till she could, couldn't even enjoy her married life a bit. Sometimes, I, I hurt myself so much for evolving myself in drug and thought like Nadia life would be better off without me always came across my mind. Yeah, that's my story. Thank you so much uh, for being on our show. We appreciate that. Uh, thank you for sharing your story with us. According to Robert Nozick, everyone is born with natural rights. And it is not to be violated even by individuals or the state. By committing a crime, the victim's right has been violated. Thus, the offender has a personal responsibility towards the victim and the community to make things right as much as he can for the crime he committed. Even though in drug cases, usually the offenders are the victims themselves, their own rights have been violated as they cause harm to their health, mentally and physically. Indirect victims such as family members, their rights also could be violated by the offenders as their life somehow intertwined to each other. The main priority of restorative justice is to assist the victims. That is why the restorative justice process gives victims the ability to establish their obligations. On the other hand, offenders are given the chance and encouragement to comprehend them, the harm they have done to their victims and the community, as well as to develop strategies for accepting the proper accountability. We we'll now hear from Mr. Chung Yu Lim, who also used to be a drug addict. Please introduce yourself. So, um, my name is Yu Lim, and I've been a drug addict for like several years, I think four to five years which I do cook, you know, cocaine. So basically at first I was just trying cocaine out of curiosity at first, but eventually it had became an addiction. So in fact, I don't have any major problems in life to let me into doing cocaine. And I was just living a happy life together with three of us, my mom, myself and my sister. Back then, my sister and I were basically partners in crimes as we shared everything among each other. We shared good times, good memories, and, even, and also bad times. We basically shared everything. But everything's changed ever since I was addicted to drugs. After being involved with cocaine, my family's reputation, good name, and image was tainted in the neighborhood. Everyone in our neighborhood was just basically dropping by. They were just dropping by at our house, wasting their time just to humiliate my mom and my sister. And I really hate that. Eventually, I do have regrets um, ever since I was involved with drugs. Looking at, looking at all the sufferings, humiliations, screamings and tears of my mother and sister, I really hate myself for taking drugs in the first place and I really hate myself for that. If I could turn back time and also in the present time, I always wanted to be part of the community and also part of the family again. And I really hope that I could be part of the neighborhood and my family and I really hope that they could forgive me from that. Well, I think it's really good uh, to hear from you that you have regretted your past decisions about drugs. So thank you a lot for having your time here with us today. In the restorative justice process, coercion and exclusion are minimized, while voluntary engagement by offenders is maximized. However, if they do not accept their commitments voluntarily, offenders may be forced to do so. And this means that one of the restorative justice goals is to integrate the offenders back to the society. Crime-related harm should entail obligations that are tied to putting things right. And obligations may be unpleasant or even painful, but they are not meant to cause pain, retaliation or retribution. Priority must be given to commitments to victims like restitution over other penalties and state requirements like fines. Now the point here to be highlighted under restorative justice is to make amends 
rather than making offenders suffer. In conclusion, the restorative justice system focuses more on the problem solving, obligations and liabilities derived from the violations rather than establishing the blame and guilt on the offender for his past behaviours. Now we shall look into the third principle of restorative justice. Let's hear first from Ms. Pawana. Hello, my name is Pawana and I am 18 years old. Uclaim is my big brother and as you all would have known, Uclaim has suffered from addiction for many years which had eventually torn our family apart, broken down me and my mom for many years and also caused disrupt in our neighbourhood as he used to engage and sell drugs to innocent children as well as teenagers around the neighbourhood. And despite growing up with Euclid, my brother, for so many years in the same house, I can barely remember moments where we used to be happy and sweet and also have each other's backs and laugh to our heart's content. This is because all that I can remember is that one specific incident when I found Euclid on his bedroom floor, motionless and unconscious due to drug o um, over overdose. And even despite all of that that happened, he still came back to the house late at night, stole money from me and my mother, terrorized us basically, and just left the house without giving us prior notice, as well as harming us and where we felt very unsafe in our own houses. And at some time, parents from our neighborhood as well would come down to our house and surround our house while cursing at me and my mother and scolding us on how our brother used to act around our neighborhood as my brother had engaged in a lot of drug living activities which apparently harmed the children and innocent teenagers around our neighbourhood where they had bought drugs from my brother and also had been engaging in activities together with my brother as well. So through that, unfortunately, quite a number of innocent children ended up in the hospital due to overdose as well. If I may ask, how do you feel about your brother right now? To be honest, this may sound quite ridiculous and funny, but I do miss my brother dearly because he was the only sibling I had ever since we grew up. And I strongly believe in second chances. So I believe that my brother deserves a second chance as well in his life. And I think that I would like to meet him and talk to him and explain on what the consequences of his actions were to me and my mother and how much we suffered throughout the years. And I genuinely hope that through me talking to my brother, he would start repenting and regretting his decisions and come back to us because I somehow know that deep down inside, my brother was always a very loving and responsible big brother to me. Thank you, Ms. Pawana, for your sharing with us. I wish you all the best in your future for you and your brother. Thank you. Restorative justice underlines participation by those who have a direct stake in the event or offence. In short, those who are involved in, affected by, or otherwise have a personal stake in the offence. In this case, participation of a specific stakeholder is represented by direct, facilitated, face-to-face -face meeting with adequate screening, preparation, and safeguards which can take place in different forms such as a victim offender con conference, a family group meeting, and a circle process. So what is the purpose of these meetings? It enables a victim and an offender to speak face to face, discuss how to put things right and ask each other direct questions. Besides that, these meetings enables victims to raise inquiries or speak with offenders directly about the consequences of the, of the offence. Hence, offenders can hear and understand the effects of their acts and offer chances for taking accountability and expressing their regret. Consequently, such a meeting has been regarded as a transformative and inspiring experience by numerous victims and offenders. In the opinion of Herbert Z, the justice system provides a framework for the work of recovery and healing, which is ultimately the responsibility of the individual victim. Furthermore, these victims are also empowered when their involvement and participation in defining needs and outcomes are maximised. Last but not least, let us go back to the questions that have been asked earlier. 
Number one, can mandatory death sentence truly uphold justice for drug offences? And number two, if the mandatory death sentence is to be abolished, does it mean that there is no more justice in the Malaysian society? Now, if we would adopt restorative justice and punishment, the answers would be in the negative. The answers would be no. As there is no room for forgiveness, retribution, or mercy in capital punishment of death penalty. As Amnesty claims, the death penalty itself has not served as a unique deterrent to crime, and how its continued use, usage has, has siphoned the necessary and visionary work towards enabling fair justice and addressing issues at the root causes. Abolishment of death penalty and adopting restorative justice, which is our topic today, it can still uphold justice as we will be able to tackle the root cause of the drug problems, particularly in Malaysia. Giving voices to all primary, secondary victims and offenders will allow us to solve societal problems effectively rather than punishing people solely because they have committed crimes. That is all for today. And thanks for watching. Thanks for watching.